Hi, Melissa. So a new feature on Zoom is, can you hear the little lady when she says, recording in progress? <laughs> I don't know if it's really right before they start recording, but it's kind of like Big Brother is watching. <laughs> Anyway, here we are. I am Megan Holmes. I am here in St. Louis. Actually, I'm here in Kirkwood, Missouri at my shop called The Needlepoint Clubhouse, also known as STL Needlepoint on Instagram. And you are? I'm Melissa McLeod. Um, I'm here at The Wool and the Floss, which is just outside of Detroit in Gross Point, Michigan. Should I say also known as at The Wool and the Floss on Instagram? <laughs> I always say that because people get confused. Are you called the Needlepoint Clubhouse or are you called STL Needlepoint? And probably a little bit of a marketing nightmare that I shouldn't have created, but you know, hindsight well, is always 2020. Where you are, so. That's true. Yeah. So um, I just I'm had to give you grief because I haven't given you grief about that. Like, grief is good. That. And I sometime offline, maybe online, when I get the guts, I'll explain to people why I did that, but I'm not sure I'm gutsy enough to explain what why right now. We'll, so. we'll cast on that for the moment. Um, <laughs> <laughs> I'm also having a little trouble hearing you and so I'm just trying to get my volume up. There we go. So okay. um, to, that's a little bit better. Yes, thank you. So together uh, we do this thing once, well, I guess we're not doing it together a couple times a month. Um, we are doing the point, we are here to do the Pointing It Out podcast um, and you are watching it right now on YouTube and um, Thanks for finding us. Here we are. Uh, this week, we are talking about, hold on, you have a really good title and I wanna make sure I read it right. Your best needlepoint yet. So um, I love that title. And one of the reasons why I love it so much is because I think that our needlepoint craft is an evolution. And I think that, um, you know, you learn some things on your own and then you learn some things from other people and then you keep learning and you keep learning and, um, we have some tips and some ideas of ways that we think anyone could enhance their stitching experience. Might be some things they already know, might be some things that they don't want to try, but <laughs> we're going to suggest it anyway. <laughs> Wouldn't you say that to be true? Yes, yeah. So we, back in back in the olden days, in ancient times, when we had, let me think about this. Ancient times, uh, 18 months ago? Yeah, that, that long ago, yes. When the dinosaurs roamed the earth, um, we used to have five knitting classes a week and three needlepoint classes a week. Plus then we had some specialty classes usually two or three times a month. So yeah. um, one of the needlepoint classes we did was with um, my finishing manager, whose name is Kirsty. Um, and she's an excellent, excellent stitcher. And she manages all the fabulous people who pull together all of our finishing. Um, and she's the one who kind of deals with the nightmares that pop up when there's some little things in the needle point that could have been done slightly differently that would have made for a better outcome or an easier job for the finishers or whatnot. So um, she and I kind of pulled this class together a few years ago and I will be honest, it wasn't terribly well attended because it sounds really boring. I mean, like these are like, you don't sit down and come out with some beautiful project when you're done. Wait a minute, though. Did you call it your best needle point yet? We did. And it's people still still didn't attend it. <laughs> we had maybe, we ran it twice, once on a weekday and once on a weekend. So we try to, you know, work around our people who have a regular nine to five job. And I think we had like two people in one class and three people in the other, maybe three and four. It was like not hugely tender. But every single one of them were like, that was the most informative two hours I have ever spent. And every single one of your customers should come to this class. So we're in a position position now where we're not even doing classes. Um, things are still kind of wonky with COVID. You know, if you're not watching this currently, like most shops are just now starting to make masks optional, but still sitting elbow to elbow with someone for two hours straight, especially when COVID was really, really bad in Michigan and my shop small, you know, I think, we're not all quite ready to go there yet. So we thought um, a little Reader's Digest version of the class um, for those that want to follow along might be fun. Well, and I was just going to say, I don't know what you charged for that class, but this admission is free. So right. isn't that amazing? <laughs> for sure. So um, yeah. So, you know, some of this is kind of nitty gritty and kind of dry and not too sexy, but um, it's the little boring things that I think 
can make a big difference in your needle point and I you'll totally be happy agree. with the outcome. So I totally agree with you. Um, yeah. So shall I start? We just roll. I think you should. And I have, you gave me a really nice outline. So I actually can follow along like a good girl awesome. this time. Um, and I think that the beginning is just so awesome and so basic, but I, we get a lot of questions about it. So we do, we do. So um, I, we are asked quite regularly, what size needle do I need? And what are these funky numbers? And I don't understand and blah, blah, blah. And for the most part, most shops give you a needle with your projects. And you can assume that if they gave you a certain size needle on a certain size canvas, that you have the right needle. So it's okay. Hopefully you can uh, that if this person is watching who called us a couple of weeks ago, they're like, this needle is not working. And I was like, oopsie, guess we messed up. <laughs> well, occasionally if we're in a hurry, we could put too small or too large of a needle on the wrong project. It can happen, but for the most part, it is safe to assume for the most part that your local needlepoint shop is going to give you the correct needle. <laughs> So normally um, a needle will come and I should have brought two sizes here. I didn't, I just brought over the bigger needle, which I don't even know if you're going to be able to see. I know. But anyways, this is a tapestry needle and the, the I'm poke, poke, poking because it's really not very sharp. So tapestry needles are not sharp. And for the most part, that's what we use a needle point because we're not piercing a fabric. We're putting, uh, oh, there you go. So you have a uh, 20 and a 22 there, right? Sure do. Patty just handed me some too. So yeah, so the smaller one is the larger number, which is counterintuitive. So you would there use is. a smaller needle, which is a size 22 on an 18 mesh canvas. And guess what? You don't really need to know any of that. You can look it up on the internet. You can call one of us. You can call your local yarn shop. It's kind of, kind of meaningless data. Truth be told, I had stitched. I've stitched since I was seven years old, which you know was just a few years ago. And I've only owned the shop for four years. And I'm the first three years I had to cheat and look at the labels on the inside of the bins. I finally have it straight. So point is, don't get all caught up in what number, blah, blah, blah. But generally you do need a 22 for an 18 mesh, a 20 for a 13 mesh. And the reason you use the bigger needle, I'm gonna back up there. You're gonna use the right size needle for the right size canvas. Because the point of, uh, needle is when you push it through your canvas, it's, oh, sorry, I should have showed this off. Let's see if I can get this straight. The tip is narrower than the eye, right? Yes. So your thread is going through the eye of the needle. Imagine that. And when you put it through your canvas, it very easily goes in. When you pull it through, when the eye gets there, it's going to have a little tiny bit of a tug to it. And that opens up those canvas threads so that the wear and tear is on the needle and the wear and tear is not on your thread. So um, a lot of times when people say, oh, my thread's getting all frayed, my thread's pulling, whatever, many times that could be because you're not using a big enough needle for your project. If you're using a 22 needle, which ideally would be for an 18 mesh canvas, and you're using that on a 13 mesh, then that needle isn't opening up that hole. And then therefore the thread is dragging against those canvas threads. The, the stitching thread is dragging against the canvas. Exactly. And I, you've got some other notes here. I almost think that needles could be a whole podcast as I'm thinking about this because there's all different kinds of needles, but let's just keep it basic. So you're using a tapestry needle. You're right. Size 20 is for the larger mesh. Size 22 is for the smaller mesh. And honestly, I've gotten to the point now where I can feel, I can tell when I have it in my hand, like which one, it's weird. I can just, I just sort of know. I'm like, oh yeah, this is definitely a bigger needle. Um, there's also petite. Well, I think that's more of like almost being a shop owner though, because we handle them all day long. Because when I just worked here one day a week, I, I'd have to put them next to each other. To know the yeah. So. The 18s are a little bit shorter. Yeah, all the things. But yeah, so I, I think it's great to point out the reason why it's a tapestry needle and why the top, what you just said is true is that it opens it up so that you're not wearing and tearing on your um, on your canvas. But that leads what I think to the next point very wonderfully, which is the point is that this opens up your canvas so that you don't wear and tear, but you're still gonna wear and tear a little bit on your thread. Of course, of course. Which is why you should use, I always thought it was, um, I th I've always been told it was from like here to here. Should your thread should be? So you think that's about eighteen inches? I was thinking from, so from here to here. Yeah, that's probably about eighteen. I was thinking twelve, eighteen. 
Um, but yeah, so you, if you're you always you always want the visual aid. I want the actual number. <laughs> because I'm the I which is the left side the number you're the number side I'm the other side whatever that is yeah, yeah. anyway so yes I yes so you want a short ish if you're if you're like doing this then you got a problem right and you're you've got a great point next so what is your next point so so people always laugh at me because literally I know at least a handful of stitchers and okay this is embarrassing I apologize in advance I've still never watched your podcast with Daryl. So is it possible you guys talked about rotator cuff injuries? Right. So overuse injuries is really kind of what that. Spoiled. So literally there have been people that have hurt their shoulder by doing this. Cause you shouldn't be getting ready to play tennis. I mean, that's terrible tennis form. So tennis people forgive me, but yeah. you know, you get my point. So, right. um, and one of my very, very good friends and customers, her name is Marna. And I yell at her about this situation all the time. And by the way, she's a nurse <laughs> and she's always using her thread too long. And so, I mean, we laugh about this all the time because she will say, I know I'm supposed to use a shoulder amount. And literally she had her shoulder operated on. And she's still doing it. And she's still, and so as she's recovering and she's just out of the shoulder brace, she's doing this again. I'm like, Marna, seriously. <laughs> so, I mean, it sounds like a big exaggeration, but literally you can injure yourself. So don't do that. So <laughs> injuries is one thing. And that's all, there's a whole podcast on that. But I think for making your, for, from the point of making your canvas the best it can be. So the idea is that it, you are going to get wear and tear. So obviously this part at the end, well, no, this part at the end is just going to keep going through the canvas and keep going through the canvas. And what that does is at the very end, some people say, well, why does it look, why do I have a line here? Well, that line is like that blue thread has gotten all broken down. How, so, so one of the questions always is, did you, are you using long lengths of thread? Because at that last basket we've stripped, that last one where you buried your thread might be all broken down basically. And it's, su right. it's kind of sucked all the dye out of it. So um, to avoid that, that's one way to avoid that situation, but to avoid that is to use shorter threads. Um, so I don't think there's anything more to say about that than that. No. So, the, the, so there's lots of reasons for keeping it to 18 inches. Correct. And that said, with some more persnickety threads, for lack of a better word, you might even use 12 inches. Water and ice, for instance. Even some um, may kind of tangles up if you get it going for too long. Yeah, I don't tend to have a problem with that as much. Um, but I, I'm just seeing the ones that like literally fall apart on you. Oh, you know? Nick, any of the metallics are going to break down faster, in my opinion, because right. they're right. Metallic. right. <laughs> so, so when we're so I personally, I think 18 inches is the longest you should go. Um, if you are stitching with velvet, you also want to keep that a little bit shorter. And the main reason you want to keep that shorter is on a regular um, thread. I just pulled a piece of silk and ivory because we're going to use this as a visual for this. Um, but you know, I can keep my tail fairly long. But if this were a piece of velvet, you would want your tail to be like here. Because what happens with velvet, if you use very velvet or petite very velvet, this needle makes a notch in the thread. Yeah. So as soon as you move it, anything beyond that notch is useless because right. you don't want that big empty notch showing right. on your needle point. Right. So with very velvet, I would keep it a little shorter because you're not able to slide this along the eye of the needle. So um, Good yeah, point. That's question mm -hmm. one. Um, if you're using ribbon style threads, and I should have brought some here, and I don't necessarily mean a ribbon, but I mean like neon rays or neon rays plus, anything handy? Or my, favorite, that, my favorite fireworks I might have handy because I always have some fireworks. F14 or F15, which is it gonna be? <gasps> oh my gosh, do I have it in here? Oh <laughs> no, no, but you know what I do have? This is because I have a piece, hold on. No, wait, I gotta see, I gotta see. Yes, I do, you totally know me. Here it is. All right, 15. There we go. So <laughs> if you can hold that up, that is, it's not made of ribbon. That is not a silk ribbon by any means, but it is constructed like a ribbon where it is flat. Actually, uh, let's see if I do this better. And so sometimes a lot of people use a laying tool with that. Some people might just use another needle, a finger or whatever. Um, what, I know one of your favorite laying tools and I brought this. It's a BLT. I usually have one right here on my. Uh, I was smart. Right, I have it. Great, but no, I don't have it. I have it, except for it's in its tube. So 
I can't get it out of this without ruining it. So I don't want to do that. You don't want to ruin your nail. This will stick to your needle minder or magnetize to your needle minder. And it gives you something to hold on to. And it gives you this nice little shaft. So you can lay that yeah. flat style thread over it as you stitch and it will keep it from turning. Yep. Um, I have discovered of late um, that I used to try to use a BLT and it wasn't really working for me personally for whatever reason. And so I've discovered these big fat needle uh, yeah. and I gives, I think I like it better because I've got more to hold on to and that's what works best for me. And it's a very individual thing, but it's going to work the same. It just has a wooden tip. Um, and you're going to lay either your ribbon style threads over it, or if you're using a pliable thread, like a Splendor or a Threadworks or something where you're pulling it apart, where Megan showed us on our stranding episode. Wake up, wake up. Um, this will help you with that too. Um, so that's just another thing with threads and trying to make threads work for you. We have had a couple of episodes on threads. It, I think, or we just had, I, I can't even remember. We've, we've been at this for a year now. I, I'm not really sure, but we've had one or two episodes solely on threads that you'll get more information about that. Yep. Um, but the other thing to keep in mind is your threads need to match your canvas size. So just like your needle yes. need to match your canvas size, yes. your threads need to match your canvas size. So for those people that are knitters, they just, they all know like all these knitting terms. There's fingering weight and DK weight, and worsted and chunky and bulky and blah, 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 blah. Ours isn't quite as neat and tidy as that because there isn't a set label for sizes of thread. Right. You just kind of need to know that vineyard silk is designed for 18 mesh. Pepper pot is designed for 18 mesh, but it works for a lot of people on 13 mesh. So you just kind of start to know those things or have your shop as a resource to go to. But again, um, a, an example of that to me, a very obvious example is a lot of people come in here. I talk about this all the time. We're a big belt, big belt city. And a lot of people are sold silk and ivory for 18 count mesh belts. And it drives me crazy because it's trying to smush too much stuff into a tight space. And so then they come in and they're like, why do I have all these bumps? And it could be that they're not following the poles and ladders of basket weave, which I don't remember if we've done a podcast on that or not, but, um, or if we're gonna get to that in this, but anyway, it could be that you're not following your direction on your basket weave, but it's also because you're trying to push so much into a space that it has no place to go. So it, it pops up on top of the canvas and you get a lump. Um, well, as, as we talked about earlier, the, the canvas threads, are designed to shift a little bit. It's just like those They're buildings that are built to sway in the breeze. <laughs> it's kind of the same thing. But yeah. these are designed to move a little bit. So they're going to move a little bit so your fat end of your needle can get through. But that also means that then they're getting bigger and then you go to the next hole and try to put something through that's a little too big and it just all doesn't come together. And the only people who are successful silk and ivory on 18 count stitchers, in my opinion, are those who have a really light they can really just keep it light going through and they're not scoopers and they're just up and down and they're really got a really light touch. Um, and I thought you were gonna say that they were tight stitchers. Well, maybe they're super tight or they're super light, but they're not right in between. And in either way, it has to be consistent because anytime you're not you know, paying really good attention and you're not gonna pay good attention and have the same consistent um, tension on a belt because obviously you're not doing that in one sitting. So um, well, anyway, you've hit my hot button. I'm like, Let's stop. Yeah, but just with everything else, um, there's always exceptions to the rule because one of my most prolific stitchers in the shop learned how to stitch at a shop in Pennsylvania and that's their thing. And she learned how to stitch with silk and ivory on 18 and her things are beautiful, beautiful. It is, but a she is, it is the not exception to the rule. She's the exception to the rule. So. I just, anyway. in case she's watching us, I don't want her to be offended because she's a great stitcher. So. No offense, but I, I'm just saying if you, again, to have your best canvas, if you're having a problem, that might be one of the answers to one of your problems is using the wrong size thread for the, for the wrong, like the wrong size mesh. So, gotcha. yeah. Okay. So I know we've talked about this before, but I don't think it can be said too much. Oh, right. Always, always, always keep your labels. So 
your label, your and I'm card. sure most of you know this, or your card, whatever the case may be, cards are slightly different from labels because that gives us a color number. With something like Planet Silk or Planet Earth, Pepper Pot Silk, Vineyard Silk, Silk and Ivory, all those things, they give you a color name and a dye lot number. So if you come in here and you say, I need more of that orange thread, we're gonna to try to not look annoyed when we say, sure, <laughs> when you hand us just a scrap like this and say, oh, I need more of this. Well, first we have to feel it, touch it, look at it and decide what kind of thread it is. Then we have to decide what the color number is. And there's no way we're ever gonna know what the dye line is. No, there's no so way. So if you keep that label and it could be either in the floss away bag with your thread, if you use floss away bags, you can open up these threads in a way that like you, after you open this twist, I was just kind of looking slide it back on. So the label stays with the thread. Um, we can't always find you old dye lots, but if we have an old dye lot number, there's a hope that we can help you find an old dye lot number. Yeah, we do have that network of people that are always kind of helping us search, but yeah. So we've talked about that before. I feel like it's beating a dead horse, but I think it's so important because having those labels, it's like going out uh, with an umbrella and hoping it doesn't rain, right? You know, if you, if you leave that umbrella at home, you're screwed. <laughs> That's right. Yeah. So I'm all about that. Okay. So in our class, then we went on to talk about starting a thread because that's the next thing you're going to do in your stitching after you've kind of gathered all your supplies. Um, and we got a little more supply talk at the end. But um, there are, you have to start your thread somewhere. And one of the most useful things I've learned in the last few years was like such a like moment for me was learning how to do a quilter's knot. And for those of you who have like sewn since you could walk, um, this is not anything earth shaking, um, but a quilter's knot, and you can look this up on YouTube, but if you basically line up your needle with the end of your thread, so I'm making a big circle. And this is less important with something like silk and ivory, more important with something if you're stitching with like two or three ply of a strandable thread. Mm -hmm. If you just tie a normal knot, you go to, to start your threads and that knot just pops right through the canvas because it's not meaty enough for your canvas. So if you put your thread in a circle like this, wrap it around one, two, three, four, it doesn't really matter how many times, three or more, I would say, and you've wrapped this around your needle and I tried to get a dark thread, so hopefully you can see that. And you hold those little wraps in place, pull your needle through, and when you're done, now this is silk and ivory, but do you, oops, where we go? I can't, I hate that you can't find where you are in the screen. That is a big honker knot. And see, I do that, I think I do that differently. I was gonna try to, I do it all in one hand and I go wrap, 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 and I grab the wraps and pull them over. Yeah, we're doing the same exact thing. It's just like what, hand. what the right hand. I know, isn't it funny that you can't find yourself? Well, when I, yeah, so, up, I actually got a loop. Oh no, I didn't, I just didn't pull it taut. So effectively we're doing the same thing. It's just, that's how so I like learned. trying to watch you and trying to think about how I do it. And like, I do it kind of naturally now. I don't know. It's right. Like, maybe we are doing it the same, but <laughs> the camera. Yeah. And I'm just, it was being very definitive about it. So if someone's trying to like learn this at home. Good um, job. Yes. See, I, you've re strung show that up. Though. I was you just going to say, this is what I do with my vineyard is I, I shove it all back through the little hole so that it all can live together. Yes. And, and I, that's the same thing you could do with silk and ivory or even that pepper pot or the DMC little tube. You can slide those right back on. Perfect. Yep, 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 yep. Um, you got it. Okay, so that gives you a big fat knot. If you are, I'm going to cut this off just for kicks. Um, and to, the reason you're talking about this in the vein of having your best needle point ever is. So when you start, you can, and I should have, if you know what? I don't, I don't want to work on a store canvas. I don't have, uh, I have some practice canvas with me. So we're going to pretend that there's a, a, oh, your mystery kit canvas. No, no that's not. It's his, summer. it's his summer friend. Oh my God. So cute. Right. Because yes, I did the winter ones. So if your, if your design was a circle in here and you're just starting out, you might not, uh, this is like, where do we start this topic? 
I know. That's why I was to keep the the when you start or end a thread, you want to keep it within the same color family that you're stitching. So like on your little boy, you would want to bury a knot of if you were starting with his like skin color, you'd want to bury it within the skin color line so that the tail was ending up in the direction you were stitching. Right. And so, and what you're talking about is a waist knot, not an away knot, correct? That, that would be a waist knot. So in my situation where I was coming up with this fake circle, I might be like, I'm not really sure what I'm doing. So I might put my knot way up here and then start stitching down here. And then when, after I've done my little spot, I can trim this knot off. I've left myself a good long distance. I can re-thread that needle and bury it within the, the color ring. I've never thought about that before. Yeah, so there's an away knot and there's a waist knot. And some people use those terms interchangeably and they're very, very different. Well, no, I know away and waist knots. What I didn't ever think about was reburying that end. I, oh my gosh, this is a light bulb moment. Because yeah, so that's the whole point of using an away knot. Well, I thought the whole point was to bury it as you stitched behind it. So like, so in other words, I'm going to come here and I'm going to stitch, stitch. Well, I'm going to come, eh, how do I, am I doing this on camera? So now I can't think of it. I know, but I'm going to stitch, 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 stitch like this. And then I'm going to tack it down to the point that then I can just cut this off and it's already all tacked down. It never occurred to me that I could cut it. And as long as it was a long enough thing and go on the back and bury it. But see what your first thing is truly a waist knot. A waist knot is designed so that you're covering it up until you get to that knot. Got you. And then you cut off the knot. And that is the same difference as in what was more typical in the old days. Let's see if I can still I am totally hearing what you're saying. And this is amazing. Have in the idea. old days, uh, we didn't have knots at all. Let's see if I can pull this through. Um, in the old days. And if I were stitching here, I might just hold my, this is the back of my canvas. I might hold the thread and stitch towards the thread. Right. which there's zero, there's zero problem with that. The beauty of having instead the knot on the front of your canvas is now these fingers are no longer held hostage having to hold. Yeah, them. see, I can't do that. I, other people hold on. I'm like, what are you doing? I can't, I have to have my other hand available. Those, those are people who have stitched for like 30 years. Like that's just how they learn. That was the style then. And it is the same exact thing really as doing the, the, um, waist knot where you're stitching towards it. So, so the other thing that we encounter all the time at the shop, particularly with belts, sometimes with ornaments, whatever, is a person will have left all of their, sorry. Oh, we try not to hate those people, but we get a little grumpy here. Well, no. And what I was going to say, we get a little grumpy, but I think aside from being grumpy, speaking of having your best canvas ever, I'm here to tell you that those finishers do not have time to trim your knot and bury your thread, trim your knot and bury your thread all along an entire belt strip. So you know what happens? They either just go ahead and finish it or they have to cut because your, your away knot is above where they have to cut to do their finishing. So, and, and that's not their fault. That's not, that's not their job, you know? Um, and so- well, what happens? what happens here is we see that and I have one of my gals sit down, they cut all those little knots out, they get out that Loran thing, they bury all those little threads. It takes a couple of hours and that adds on to your finishing cost. Oh, so you charge for that? Oh, absolutely. Because if we don't do it, the project's gonna fall apart. I mean, you're gonna have sprung threads here and there over the course of time. Well, um, um, where we see it most often and um, is belts, honestly. And I don't think people understand like I didn't until just five seconds ago that the idea is to then be able to, th I was always uh, under thinking that I was gonna stitch over top of that again with a, in a different section of the canvas. So that's what I always do. I always put that where I know I'm gonna stitch over it with like, say the guy, like, I'm gonna stitch over it with the blue cause I'm doing the, you know, like I, I know I'm gonna tack it down at some point. It has never occurred to me to go back and tack it. I don't know why. Um, well, and I, I but, most people don't typically, if you're using it away, not properly, you're not using it. You're really only using it either when you're working with a very open stitch 
because you can't plan those yep. naps super Very well. anywhere. Yep. Um, or you're using it right at the beginning of your project. So you shouldn't have to go back and bury 50 knots that, or, you know, trim 50 knots and bury at the end. It should just be the couple. And I think, and I think that's why this is such an aha moment to me, because I think people, some people think that that's the only way that you can start and stop. I, I, my guess is that the person who stitches a belt and there's knots all across the top and all across the bottom, must not understand that you can tack your thread in different ways, um, which I think we're going to get to because um, why would you keep doing that? You know, like there, it, it takes more time, to, in my opinion. But the other thing is the reason why the belt thing works okay is because most, okay, I'm not going to say that. I don't know most. I know my, our finisher uses an adhesive to get that backing on because there's no other way to get that backing on. And so I don't worry about it. It annoys him because it gets in his way. So he just chops them with these giant scissors. I've seen him do it and it freaks me out because I'm like, ah, <laughs> but he's done it for 35 years. So he feels great right. doing that. But um, he, the adhesive will keep the threads from popping up on top. So it's going to be okay. But um, it's not going to be okay when they do that on our four inch round ornament. That's exactly right. That's exactly right. And so those finishers then have to I know some finishers use a little dab of acid-free glue. They have to do some. They have to do something because it's there. Well, that, that's why, like I said, we either say, "How about we send this back to you? This is what needs to happen," or I say, "We can do it here, but you're going to pay an hourly rate for us." Right, to right, do right. It. I don't. Um, yeah, I just don't see that as much on. Anyway, yes. It doesn't have. It doesn't happen that often here. I'd say like right. two or three times a year. We yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay. Because but, most finishers have been trained to not. I think what I'm also doing is telling myself, like, this is such a great episode because people need to know this stuff. <laughs> yeah. So the other thing, when you're doing waist knots, we're going to pretend that my red thread is blue. Um, and if I were starting in this upper right-hand corner, like a right-hander would do, um, I would want to put this here. Um, this is now a waist knot. I'd want to put it there because I'm going to be stitching towards that. Right. right. And then you... But more importantly, I'm putting it in the same color splotch on the canvas. Yes. If I put my big blue thread starting down here, in the white, you're going to have a blue shadow through that white. And I see that, unfortunately, more often than I want to see. And when the canvas is done, there's nothing we can do about that. And right. to me, that's a little heartbreaking because right. putting the, the knot here versus here is no difference in when you're stitching it. Right. But outcome is huge. So I always try to keep the waist knot in the path of the direction you're stitching as well as in the same color patch, if that's the right term. No, that makes exact in the area that you have colors that are dark enough to hide it. I mean, yeah, that's just kind of a common sense thing. Um, and then, so to the point, back to the point though of burying all those, um, so you, you trim your knot and then you go back and bury it. Um, I don't think a lot of people realize this either because I tell people this all the time and I sit here in your notes, the direction in which you bury those threads is important. Yes. Right? Yeah. So especially when you're doing basket weave, a little less important with decorative stitches because you've got a little more wiggle room, I guess. Um, but with basket weave, you really want to make sure, and I learned this after I've been stitching for probably 30 years, um, that if you're doing a true basket weave or continental, it's, I think um, we all want to bury it on a diagonal, especially because the basket weave's done on a diagonal, but that'll make a big pucker in the front of your canvas. So you yep. want to either go on a true vertical or a true horizontal. Have I told you what I call that? What? The mole hole. You know, <laughs> like a mole's crawling across your yard and it's popping up, you know, it's popping up the little like dirt on the top. You're creating a mole hole on the top of your canvas. So you know what I'm wondering. So what? So what's always interesting to me is, I have noticed, and hopefully no one will call me out and say that I'm wrong on this. But maybe they will, because usually I'm wrong on something all the time. Um, when you have your waist knot, if it's not in a straight line, it's not an issue, right? I was thinking that, that tension. That's right. I think you're. I think you're covering that in a in a way that you're not popping up under the threads after not that. Not disrupting I was thinking the exact saying. same thing. I would love to hear if somebody has an opinion on that, but I think what you're saying is correct. That if you have that thread down there, you're it's, right. it's just covering it, it's moving along. But if you're gonna go back, because what you're doing is breaking up, you're not, you're not laying that cleanly with your needle. 
you're breaking up threads as you go along possibly you know because you're not obviously finding the exact right you see you know what i'm saying anyway. right right so yeah so there's not a tunnel so you're creating a hole is basically the other um way to start a stitch that is kind of uh was newer to me again i think actually our friend susie valerie taught me how to do this at a uh, tnna class a few years ago she taught me laura taylor oh because it looks like an oh. l that's so funny so a pin stitch can be called an l stitch or a t stitch or a pin stitch it's really all the same thing mm -hmm. and what you're doing with that um it, and I still have a knot in this, so we're going to leave the knot just because it'll be easier for me to demonstrate. You're going to come up in hole A. Let's just call it hole A. And you're going to go down. Sorry, I'm trying to do this so you guys can see and so it's not backwards to me. You're going to go down, directly down one canvas thread. Mm -hmm. And my L might be backwards to you when we're done here. You're going to go next door to where you just put your thread down. Mm -hmm. up and go back down in the same hole and that's an l now i apparently i have trust issues because i don't always trust an l so if i have space i make it a t which means going to the other side of that shared hole mm -hmm. coming up and going back down in that shared hole and then this is i'm going to show you guys because and hopefully i'm not going to make myself look like a fool um so if I pull on this, it's staying put, of course, but of course I have the knot. If we cut off that knot, there's the moment of truth, Megan, is it gonna work? Well, it's worked for you before. I'm like, oh boy, here we pull go. Pull on this, see how hard I'm pulling? The canvas is moving and this thing isn't going anywhere. But here's, here's where you need to explain this to me. Why am I doing that? So you would do this, Let's say if you were a lot of times in a Bargello stitch where you okay. have a nice long stitch. Because so it would go, you're covering that over, right? Yeah. So this, you wouldn't use this for me. And, you know, everyone, different way, different strokes for different folks. I wouldn't use a pin stitch or a T stitch if I were doing basket weave. And you could do That's this. Different. Let me, let's. Let well, you don't that. need to. You don't need to because you're covering it up. Like you're tacking right. your thread down when you're stitching over top of it. Well, let's say in this blue section, you want to do Alicia's lace, which basically creates an over two diamond all the way around. Mm -hmm. um, and there's different names for different stitches. So people might call that stitch something else. Um, but I call it Alicia's lace and it's it's doing a bunch of little diamonds all over and there's open space. I think it's also you know, called alternating continental, isn't it? Well, that's, but, but just those for people over ones, like whatever, yeah. you know, so I, I get confused. I, I shouldn't say I get confused. There's just different names for different, different stitches. But in any event, if you're doing it all open and you're like, well, I'm not exactly sure where my open spaces are going to find, you could do an away knot way up here. Yeah. And then after you get all your little diamonds in, you could go back and feed your, your trim your way knot and feed it through the back. Yep. Most finishes, they cut off the canvas, two canvas threads away from the edge of your work. Yes. So you could do a pin stitch right in this border. Yes. And I think on Great Lakes Good Times, I think I talked about using a pin stitch for that darning stitch in the border. If you, depending yes. on what you'd had stitched already. Yes. So yes. you could put your pin stitch right in the border, right? Like just outside. It can't be four stitches outside because just like you It'll said earlier, off. someone with big scary scissors is going to cut that off. <laughs> but if you put it like in that column and of the holes, usually we talk about threads in the open, but if you do it in the column of holes right in between those two threads, then you should be okay with doing a pin stitch or a T-stitch in that area. But hiding and is always a good- I'm just like, this just blows my mind. Like, I know, it, yeah. It and I think it does, it still works with an L-stitch. Like I said, I clearly have trust issues because I always do it three times. And the, the magic is always sharing a hole that you're you know going down in. Yes so that it basically locks itself in yeah yes so those are many many ways you can begin a stitch as a matter of fact you can almost use many of those ways to end a stitch because you could end with a pin stitch if you wanted to uh-huh with you know if you were at the edge of your uh, work or yes. if you i'm just trying to think i don't think you'd have a i don't think you'd be able to get it tight enough to do a knot but maybe yeah i just don't know really why you do that but you 
theoretically could. Sure. Like I've heard of people yes. do that. So yeah. typically when you are ending your threads, you are going to take, let's pretend a bunch of this were stitched. There was a lot more than just this little spot. You're gonna take your needle and run it through the back of your stitches again, if it's basque weave or continental, either horizontal or vertically. And you're gonna run this through and you're gonna run it through about two or three inches. Like, you know, the length of the needle and maybe even a little more. Um, and again, back to our earlier discussion, if you're tying off and you're working on this piece and you're tying off your white, I would try to tie off your white in a white space. I would try to tie off your blue in a blue space. Try to keep colors within the same colors. It's less important with a lighter color being tied off in a darker color space. Yes. You know, like if you were had just started this yeah. white, I don't know why you'd run out here. You could probably just tie off your white into the blue. Mm -hmm. the world will come to an end. Of course, none of this, the world's going to come to an end. Because there are no needle plant please. Needle you will plant. not be arrested. But you're not going to see the white in the blue. I can guarantee you, you'll see a shadow of blue in your white. So. Um, With you. Yep. Yes, yes, yes. Um, Bargello Tux. That name always like kind of like throws me. Because like, what is that? So, um, most of the time, and I, I am assuming it's called a Bargello tuck because people used it when they used to stitch a lot of Bargello because the stitches in Bargello are long. Very long, yeah. I did not know what this was, so I'm learning right now. Okay, you, you do know what it was. You do know what it is. You probably used it regularly. You just didn't know it had a name. Okay. So that's, that's how it was for me. So, a Bargello tuck primarily in most needle pointers lives is used when you're working with a rayon thread that's super slippery. So yes. we all have, some of us a love hate relationship with neon rays. I mean, there's nothing better than the look of neon rays, but it is not the easiest thread to work with. It's, it's all rayon, it's super slippery, but that shine is phenomenal and you love it. But if you have stitched with neon rays, you know that if you just go through that little two or three inches we just talked about and cut off your thread, it's gonna pop out. Like there's, wool wants to stick to wool. Silk will stick to silk. Slippery, again, slippery is just slippery. It doesn't work. So, mm -hmm. uh, when you, and I wish I had something that was partially stitched. I can't believe I don't have anything here. But you would run your needle through, and I'm just gonna do a darning stitch. We're just gonna pretend like you're gonna run through the back of your stitches like this. Uh -huh. If this were neon rays, there is no way that would stay. So you're gonna turn back around and go the opposite direction. Uh-huh. So again, this is, For you know, you would, you would not be going through the canvas. You'd be going through the back of your stitches. Yeah, so yeah, 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 yeah. So yes. it's, it's kind of intuitive. Once you've been burned by neon rays once, you know how to do this. You and just this, didn't know what happened. This is just your ending your threads, not starting. So I'm like, then you're in right. the spot and then it, okay. Well, that's what I'm saying. Like it's hard to- Yes, I, yes, I, yes, 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 I got I it. apologize. I didn't have a real piece with no, me. that's so, okay, I get what you're saying. Yeah. Well, like if we're doing it on here, we'd go through, if this were the back, you'd go through the blue and then you turn around and go back through the blue this way, like a channel above. Yeah, so got they it. have the Bargello talk. And I believe, again, it's called a Bargello talk because Bargello was always done in wool in classic needlepoint. Um, but they're two, four, and six threads high. So if you run your thread, your, if you're trying to bury your threads in something that's six threads high, going through it one direction just isn't going to Well, and the other reason I think is because you probably have to kind of get your, weave your needle into the canvas opposed to just sticking it underneath stitches because there isn't any stitches behind Bargello. It's all, it's just bare canvas. You've got, you're, you've got all these open holes here. And so what I think they're saying is they're tucking this under all these stitches un underneath the canvas, right? Well, you're on the back side of the canvas. So you don't want to go underneath the canvas so then you're going to make a mess of the front side of your canvas. What am I not understanding? So your Bargello is going to do this on the front. Yeah. And hopefully on the back, it's also going to do that because you're going like this. Correct, correct. So all of this open right is just canvas. So you're going to go in and you're going to have to weave that into the canvas and through, not the thread, because the thread is just doing this. Yes, but that would scare me to weave through the canvas. I feel like I would disrupt the front. I don't know how else it's going to stay, though. You think it's just going to well, stay? Because you're going to do a Bargello tuck. <laughs> so, so 
I, we're, we're kind of beating the dead horse here because most people now aren't stitching in the classic Bargello style, which was done in pattern iron wool. Right, and, right, 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 yeah. Knitting, like, again, we're a knitting shop in a yellow shop. Wool sticks to wool. Yeah, like, yeah. It yeah. wants to play together. So if you ran it through the back of the wool threads once and then turned around and went back the other way, yep. it's good enough. Yep, yep, so, yep. Uh, yes, I got um, it. So there's our lesson on Bargello Tuck, which there you we know, go. you've probably been doing it with me on Rays and never knew it, but that's basically- I do all it. kinds of stuff on the backs of things to make things tuck, and I never know if they're right or not. I just make sure it doesn't show on the front. <laughs> so, okay. So the other thing that I find that especially with newer stitchers, they're gonna run, so let's pretend th this is nice stitching on the back, which it is not. Yes. They're gonna run their thread through the back of their stitching. Okay, we know that's not enough to, to actually hold it, but we're for demonstration purposes, we're gonna say that it went through a bunch of thread. Yes. What they're gonna wanna do, the newer stitcher is gonna do this. Yes. And they're yeah. gonna lose that thing because they're so scared to get close to the back of the canvas. And then when you pick up your next thing, inevitably, we'll see you're if I can make it. Stuck on it. Yes. Your, one of your threads is going to go through here. Of course, I can't make it do it now. But those little tails are going to pull with you. Front. Yes. Yeah. And so what you really want to do is instead of what I did the first time, you're going to take your scissors. And we'll see if I can, if I have enough hands to show this. Um, Let's see. I think you can see that. And That's you're going to trim sense. this. You're going to put your scissors on your thread and you're going to back yourself all the way down to your stitching and you're going to cut it right there. Thank you. Yeah. Yes. And okay. what I'm cracking up about over here is Melissa's notes say the leftovers. It makes us like we're eating pizza. The leftovers should are going to get in your way. So you got to cut those leftovers all the way down. And you're right. And that nothing drives me more crazy. And when I very first learned from my um, teacher, I was kind of like you, I was so worried. So I'm like very, um, she's like, always go perpendicular, which what I was doing to your, you know, and I'm going, and I caught like eight or nine or 10. And she's like, okay, wait, 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 wait. We're not trying to tap, you know, get the leaning tower of pizza pulled back up here. All we're doing is tacking down a few threads, believe it or not, like get yourself under a couple, two, three threads, pull it up and it will stay there. It's just, it's just sitting right underneath the surface, underneath all of its friends. And you can go all the way down and it's going to stay. Nobody's going to, you would literally have to get your needle and like dig it back out to get it back out. I mean, and that's why it should be hard to. Well, and I, I tend to bury like almost the, like probably that much I go under because I have seen too many nightmares where things pop out. So I, I tend to bury under like almost the length of the needle. I mean, not, not quite because you're right. Then you can't even pull the needle end out. But, you know, a, a good two thirds of the needle, because then you still have enough to pull out. But that cutting close to the canvas, what you've already stitched is super exactly. important. Exactly. And I'm talking about basket weave too. Like if you're doing some other stitch, like if you're doing yeah, see, and I do a lot more decorative stitches. And so you, because those aren't as tight and snug. You have you to vary it further. I'm just saying when I very first learned, I was like trying to push it under all these threads and then I didn't want to cut it all the way. And she was like, no, no, a couple, a couple threads and cut it down to the nub. You're good. So right. Point now there is our magic save. We talked oh. about this quite a bit. We <laughs> both love our snag nabbits. I never so, got enough. Yeah. So if you end up, you're, you're maybe learning from this episode, you have a couple little tails, leftovers, quote unquote, that pop to the front. This snag nabbit will save you because it is a sharp needle on one end or sharpish. It's probably a tapestry needle. And then this other end is all bumpy and like ridgy. And so if you've got one of those little leftovers that have popped to the top, you just find where it's popping up. You stick the sharp end through the canvas and those little ridges, grab that leftover and pop it back to the back where it belongs. So um, this is a really great tool for that. It's really great if for some reason one of the tension of one of your stitches is looser than it should be. Lots of good uses for this. But if you forget about the leftovers, that's your saving grace. So, yeah. Yeah. Um, the last thing with burying is um, don't don't use your thread to the very 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 end. Right. So back to my sample. Unless unless you don't think you're gonna make. <laughs> well, let's see. So you've got you've got choices. Like if assuming you have more thread, which right. Must do, or you have more access to thread, you're better off um, not working it down to the very end because what ends up happening is 
Okay, so right now when you're stitching, you've got this nice long length to work with. Well, let's pretend you're to the end of this thread. This thread's gonna be really beat up by the time we're done because I've done so much. Yeah. If you're trying to do your last couple of stitches with this yeah. much thread, you're going to be making those stitches way tighter because now you're trying to turn. Yep. And yep. No stitch. And those last couple of stitches are going to be so much tighter than the rest of your stitching. It's going to look terrible. Yep. So yep. I think that, again, especially when we first start stitching, we're kind of having, for some of us, a little bit of a heart attack about the expense of this hobby we just hopped into. And I'm going to get like every little bit out of it that I can. Like when I used to stitch with my friend Terry, she started seriously stitching before I did. And like if I had this much thread left over, I would cut it off and put it in my little floss away bag for the next time I use that thread, like which might be on a different project. And she'd be throwing, and my friend Betsy, who now works here, would be in stitching with us. And she'd throw it in the oat bowl. And we're both going, oh, but that's expensive. Thread. You could still do that. Well, now I've learned that after it's been dragged through the, the canvas that many times, like just let it go. It is the cheapest part of the entire process. It's Your true. Time, it's, canvas, like all those things are worth It's so totally much. true. If you do find yourself in one of those situations though, where you're really struggling to make one, that last skein, maybe you have like, you're like, oh, I have to make it through here. I can't find that other guy, let whatever. Another tip is petite needles. Someone told me that one time. Yeah. The petite needle point. doesn't take as much length to get in and out. And so I, I would invest in a set of petite needles just to get your, and those are just shorter. And I hate stitching with them on the regular because my hand is just used to the longer needle. So I, I know how it feels in my hand. But if I'm in a situation or if someone is in a situation where they're like, I don't know if this is going to work. I'm like, get yourself a set of petite needles. Cause then at the end, you can try to make that tail go. Yeah. We carry those and I, I know that some people love them and I personally, they're not my thing either, no. but that's a really, really good use for them that I hadn't thought of. So see, every time we do this, we learn something from each other. That's so. true. That is true. Uh, okay. I, we're going to fly through these last couple things because I feel like we've been jabbering for a long time. I didn't notice what time we started. So um, wash your hands, even before COVID. With needlepoint, <laughs> always wash your hands. It will save you from so many issues. And you might not think that you have a little of whatever in your hands. Wash your hands before you start stitching. End of story. Um, people ask this question all the time. So I've got my red threaded and I've just stitched these dots. Can I jump from one dot to another in this little circle? My answer is going to be absolutely. I mean, they're only like two threads apart, even though it's a white background, there's not, I, I don't think it's really going to show. Then, but if you, because this is a white background, if you're going from red to this red, I probably wouldn't jump all the way across. There. I wouldn't. I'm a little OCD in that way and I'm never OCD, but yeah. <laughs> now, like down here, I probably wouldn't jump from stripe to stripe on the blue and the white because you've got a lot of options. It's going to be really hard to tie off your little red dots anywhere else that's but why I might know, jump the other people say well you can't really tell and the truth is in sometimes you really can't tell when you're stitching but when you get a backing on that for finishing and a lot of times it's a white something it's either going to be a white like muslin for for whatever it's going to it's there's a chance it's going to show more so you're going to see shadows on the front of your canvas so that to me that's why it's important to not jump yeah. all of those colors behind your white so other teachers have told me they're kind of, again, you know, I was like a number, but even I go with a little bit of judgment call here. Um, if it's more than an inch away, don't do any jumping. And this wow. might only be an inch and a half, but I still wouldn't do it. Like, you know, I, I might go from there to there and I'd be more likely to go from there to there if this were sky blue than if it were white, you know? So you just kind of have to think about what's the after effect of this. And some of that you learn more obviously with experience, but. I think some of it is very logical if you just think about what the end result is going to be as you right. go. So. You also know yourself. And for me, I'd rather tie it off and start over again in another spot because I don't want to see. But if you think, oh, that's not going to bug me, then just go for it, you know? Right. right. Um, and okay. to make your best canvas in the finish. And yeah. There we go. Your best <laughs> needlepoint yet. Um, <laughs> frames. We have a whole episode on frames versus no frames. So we're not going to beat this dead horse either. Um, Megan and I are both professed 
you know, mainly frames, but definitely no frames are okay in our world, in our personal world. We're not here to judge anyone. The only thing that I will absolutely tell you, and my finisher, my finishing manager has said to me, please share this wherever you can, is Krynik is an all um, metallic thread, all synthetically made, it will not block. So when they block something, so when if you stitch off of a frame and your piece turns into a trapezoid, if it is a man-made product, or, uh, naturally made product, cotton, silk, wool, they will lightly steam it and they'll pin it and it will go back into a square. Um, however, that said, those items have memory. And so if you finish it into a soft uh, product, like a clutch purse, let's say that is uh, with a fabric back, that now square is still going to want to go back to being a trapezoid. But what I really want to say here is Krynik in particular, because it's all metallic, um, it, it won't block. Like if it's wonky, it's going to get slightly unwonky, but it's pretty still going to be wonky. Yeah. So if you want to do a Christmas ornament that's like all metallic, use a frame. I know you might not be a frame user, but if you want that metallic, 100% metallic look and just use a frame. That's, that's the only time that I'm gonna like kind of beat somebody up about frame or no frame. Like that's the time to try out a frame. And if you think it's not for you, then don't stitch in 100% frame. I will say though, unless you're not completely <laughs> concerned about your round ornament not being totally round. Well, that's true. If you're okay <laughs> with an egg. <laughs> you, well, or if it's just, it's just never going to hang. <laughs> and, you know, sometimes I look at things that come back and I'm like, oh shoot. And the finisher's like, look, I blocked that four times. That right. was not this, and this looks way more circular than it did when I got it. And right. so, you know, it's, I can improve it. It's just never going to go totally straight. So, and it's again, using a hundred percent man-made product. Right. That, yep. That's yep. The, yep. 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 Um, just gonna throw out these couple of terms because sometimes you hear people talking about clean holes and dirty holes. And if you're a newer stitcher, you're like, what? My stuff's all clean. I don't do dirty. So I washed my hands. That's right. um, so what we're talking about when you're talking about a clean hole and dirty hole is ideally as you're stitching, you want to come up through the canvas. Get back to my visuals. Um, you wanna come up, sorry, up through the canvas in an empty hole. So. You want to come up in an empty hole, which if you're looking at a chart of diagram will always be an odd number. And you want to go down in quote unquote, a dirty hole, meaning a hole that's already been used once because so most holes are shared for the most part in most of the footage. And your down stitches are always an even number. So if you heard the, hear the word clean and dirty, you're coming up in an empty hole and you're going down in a used hole or an already shared hole. And the obvious reason for that is because invariably your thread has is going to touch. So it's going to pull the other one up just a little bit. Um, yeah, so you yeah. want to, you're trying to keep the coming up from disrupting anything. When you pull right. it down, everything's going to fall. In the and sometimes you have to, I mean, that's just the nature of the beast. Um, right. And so that's why your snagmatic comes in handy. Okay. <laughs> I'm, I'm turning around and looking for a good example back here. Okay. So this canvas, let's pretend you were doing a little water stitch. Um, and this isn't a good example. I should have pulled a better example of what I'm trying to say. I guess I'm not gonna worry about this. If you're doing a decorative stitch and you're trying to figure out how to do it, many times, um, if there's a lot of interruptions at the top, I say to people, well, just turn your canvas over right. and start the stitch here and work your way down. Right. Um, it feels awkward to do it upside down, but depending on the shape of your canvas, you're going to have that aha moment with your stitch sooner if you can flip the canvas over based on the interruption. So I, if I were smarter and more well prepared, I would have had a better canvas to show you that. But just keep in mind, flipping your canvas over and make, stitching it with the design upside down is totally okay and many times it makes sense. And especially if you want, I, I do it a lot when I've got, and I know this isn't the point you were trying to make, but like, if you don't want to have your, dragging your hand over your stitch and you've already, so you turn it. Correct. Kind that of. also is a valid reason to do that too. Yep. Um, really, really important to have good sharp scissors in the needlepoint world. Um, 
And that doesn't necessarily mean breaking the bank. Um, I have used these little scissors a number of times since we've been on here. Mm -hmm. I think these are like $6 scissors. Mm -hmm. um, you know, not super high end, but they are super duper pointy. pointy. There we go. There's the point. Yeah. Um, and they will get your threads cut nicely and evenly. Um, my favorites, of, as I've talked about many times, are these um, Italian made no, I know. scissors. What are they called? Um, Premax? Premax. I get them from Trinic. Um, and they have a curved gingers. I love my gingers too. The, I do love my gingers. And those are one of the limited edition ones, blah, blah, blah. I have every year, you know, blah, blah, blah. Mm. Um, but you want just a good quality scissor. Like don't pick up your preschoolers abandoned, you know, dull scissors. I don't remember. It's just going to frustrate you because it's not going to give you a clean cut. And so then your thread is going to potentially unravel or unwind, or it's just, it's just going to frustrate you. That's yeah. the only. Yeah. So good scissors, uh, good embroidery scissors, whatever the price point may be. Yep. Yep. Um, last issue, uh, shaped ornaments and extra rows and embellishments. So I did pull out a couple of examples. So cute little sock monkey here. <laughs> he was successfully a shaped ornament because his curves are nice and gentle. So my finisher could even get up here and give him actual legs. We didn't need to stitch him between the legs. So with your shaped ornaments, you need nice gentle curves. And so here's another example. This canvas was not, these are not nice gentle curves on the design itself. So we, I think Megan actually taught me a while ago that the proper term for this is shadow stitching. So making like a little shadow around here. But again, you can't just go three threads outside of the star and make it still super jiggity jaggedy. It, nice, it needs to be a nice gentle curve. Right, right. Um, the other thing to be aware of is in this situation, I used all sorts of glitz and glamour on this piece. I love that, yeah. There are bugle bees. There's this gorgeous, precious model that they don't make anymore. Although I just found a, a replacement, I think. I hope it's coming tomorrow. I'll, I'll keep you posted on it if that's uh -huh. successful. Um, but I'll be honest, my finisher probably hated me when she had to finish this. Because if you can see over here, look how close my beads are to the edge of the canvas. There were probably a lot of curse words when she's trying to hand stitch the backing to the front, the cording to the edge, and all these beads are that close. She probably hated me. If I were uh, smarter then or nicer, I, I will say smarter because I think I've always been nice. Um, <laughs> I would have stitched a couple more rows so that my 3D embellishments were not Totally on top of the edge of the you know stitching. I just had a conversation with someone today and I wish I could remember what her Instagram handle is because I'd give her credit for it but she's talking about sending us a um oh my gosh what's the thing in New Orleans that you stick pin voodoo doll voodoo doll yeah and she did this really cool loop turkey work hair mm -hmm. and I looked at it and I was like how is the finisher so I would say that what I'm, my point is, it was all along the edge. And right. what I said to her is, you know, I really think you might want to put a couple of right. sewing stitches. Otherwise, it's, all his hair is going to get caught up in the sides. Like, there's no way around it. There's so much. And so then, but the other thing, too, is that I think what they could do is just what they would, ha what they would have to do, if there were not sewing stitches, is they're going to have to bend that canvas back and leave a little bit of their canvas. I would be surprised if yours was completely covered by the cording. Um, I mean, they probably did the best they could, but my point is that if you get something back and you've used beads on the edge and right. you're like, man, I see a couple canvas threads. Well, there's only so much they can do, you know? Well, I will say, you know, my finishes are darn good. Well, so there isn't any canvas showing, but I have a feeling there were a number of curse words that were spoken. Well, either did. that or else a couple of those beads went bye bye, and you don't even know. <laughs> it could be. Who knows? I won't look too closely. We don't want to try that. Out. But so, the point um, is, like, give your give yourself and the finishers a break by giving a little extra room so that you're not frustrated um, when it comes back. Right. Right. Um, yeah. So I think I've I've kind of 
killed the topic. We had a little bit more, if you can believe it, in our two-hour class, but I tried to break it down to the most meaningful part. Well, and I think, again, that we're trying to do our best to just give you some ideas of things that will help you um, and then help, again, just help the process along because you'll be happier. You've spent the time and the money, and we just want to help you get your you know, process to the point where you'll be really satisfied in the end. Um, we, you know, I, you kept saying beating a dead horse, and I think, I think you're right, but that's not what we're trying to do. We're, try, we're not trying to like beat it into you. We're trying to say, we don't want to belabor the point, but this is all going to help you at the end game of your, of your canvas. And if, well, and I think my, my beating the dead horse comments were more for maybe our loyal watchers because. Oh, sure. They've heard it over and over. Like, else from time well, time. But so. truth is a lot of these, um, a lot of these tips are important for different reasons. So right. we've talked about those for different like stranded threads, the reason why to, um, you know, use the snag nabbit or make sure you, train, you know, so, um, so I think that hopefully, you know, people are getting something out of it and understanding different reasons for paying attention to these different things. And we all, we know too, that stitchers are all different and you're using different tools. You're using different types of threads. You're using different types of canvases. And so hopefully these will, some of these will apply to the way that you're stitching your canvas. So yes, 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 yeah. I think you're it. awesome. And you, you drove this way more than I could. You did a great job. So yeah. I'm kind of just felt like I was along for the ride this time. <laughs> I, said, I have to share some credit with my finishing manager here because she was the kind of original like brainchild of this class. And I think it's because she's the one as the finishing manager who has the finishers coming back to her and saying, I've got this little problem. The beads are too close to the edge or I tried to block this and the chronic didn't totally block. So yep. she um, really was uh, very uh, important in creating this class and I helped her round it out and um, we had fun doing it. So. I think it's great and I think that we're going to keep doing this. I think we've gotten good feedback from um, giving tips and tricks in different specific areas and so we'll keep doing it and uh, hopefully you'll stick around. So um, I, I think that ties it up for, for this week. Um, yep. If you have not already, I know we say this every single time, but we really hope that you hit that subscribe button. Um, I tried to do it from a non-logged in um, uh, phone, my husband's phone. I was like, oh, I'll get an extra, you know, and he wasn't logged in on his Gmail account on his phone. And so um, I think it, you might run into that problem. I've heard some people say, I don't know how to subscribe. Well, you have to have some sort of an account to log in with. But if it's easy for you, if you've got your um, Google Drive, you can you can log in and you get and you can subscribe and then you'll get all the information, including information. Um, I'm going to say it again because we mentioned it last week about our pending retreat. So yeah, yeah. Uh, we are yeah, getting hard. closer to announcing uh, the details and um, yeah, so be sure to be um, subscribed to us here on YouTube, to be following us at the Pointing It Out podcast um, Instagram account. And um, of course, we'd love for you to follow our own accounts too, because we we often are doing things on each other's accounts. So uh, at the Bull and the Floss and at us to a point. So that wraps it up, my friend. Okay, well, good to see you. As always, and, uh, you have a great night and uh, we'll see you next time. Sounds good. Okay. Bye. Bye.